together, and that is a common religious practice, a common set of beliefs huh, called an ontology, a common purpose in life. And then, of course, you have economic and social links in common as well. So this is the way to glue things back together and create a society or create a community that can get through the tremendous changes that we're facing in the next few years. You think things are crazy now. I've been telling you, I've been saying this for more than five years now. Things are going to get really, really crazy. And then they're going to get crazier. And then they're going to get like unimaginably crazy. I'm serious. You are going to wake up one morning and there are going to be these little triangular three-eyed nano creatures running around eating everything and you're going to go, what the... Huh? Or, you know, flying saucers landing on the Empire State Building or something. Something unimaginable is going to happen. Huh? Maybe more than one thing. Maybe several unimaginable things before breakfast. How are you going to deal with that? You have to have consciousness that's rooted in transcendence, that's not dependent on this material world because this material world is changing faster and faster. So if your happiness or lack thereof is based on the conditions in the material world, you're going to be miserable because when things begin to change faster and faster, nobody's going to be able to keep up. We need to be grounded in spiritual consciousness which is eternal. Then we can be happy without any difficulty, without any change. Uh, that's the advantage of spiritual consciousness. So if you change your consciousness, you will change your experience of the world, even if the world goes crazy. You won't be involved because you won't be in the world. See? You'll be out of the world, in the spiritual world. That's the whole point. The people who are engaged in spiritual consciousness, even if they're not fully enlightened, fully self-realized, they still have a tremendous advantage over the people who aren't engaged in such practices. Huh? And when things get really tough, really difficult, you will be much better off than the average person. So you will be able, you'll have a much better chance of surviving and getting through this without major problems. So our cure for the current crisis is you become spiritually conscious, and you build a community of people who are spiritually conscious. Get together. Huh? Together we're much stronger. Just like if you take a stick, you can easily snap it. But if you take a bunch of sticks and wrap them with cord together, you can't break it no matter how hard you try. There's strength in numbers. Especially when people have a coherent philosophy that they hold in common. And what could be more coherent than the esoteric teaching? It's completely consistent, completely transcendental, completely logical, completely provable. Huh? Like we say again and again, you don't need faith. You don't need faith to be a student of the esoteric teaching because, just like Christina posted this morning on the Kurukshetra forum, as soon as you put it into practice, you start getting these wonderful spiritual experiences. Uh, so you put it into practice, and you get those spiritual experiences, and this confirms the method. You don't need faith. It's scientific. You go into the laboratory of your own consciousness and do the experiment, and you'll get the result. So you can bring more people into this uh, practice, into this community, by your sharing your own experiences with them, just by being friends with them. You can help them. You can actually uh, be like an assistant guru. Okay? We want everybody to become gurus someday, all of our students. The way you do that is by helping others. Learn how to do it now, and then you can spend your whole life uh, and get tremendous spiritual credit. Because every time somebody accepts a spiritual instruction from you, you get the credit. And then you get advancement from that. 
Huh? So help us out here and we'll all benefit. How many uh, people do we have? Huh? 13? 14 again? That's great. That's great. I want to see especially all the students of our uh, university courses attending the Sunday Satsang live if possible. When we get to 20, then we have to buy an upgrade, yeah, which we haven't had to do yet. So make us buy the upgrade, okay? Come to the Sunday Satsang, invite your friends, and so on. Did you have a question? Oh. So, now let's... Uh, Oops, where are we here? Let's look at nectar of devotion. How's the sound? Sound is good? Nectar of devotion, chapter 4. Devotional service surpasses all liberation. I hope you went back and listened to the audio because uh, I'm not going to go through the text. I'm just going to comment on it. Srila Rupa Goswami likes to quote from the Srimad Bhagavatam because Srimad Bhagavatam gives many, many stories and accounts, historical accounts of devotees who attained success in self-realization. Oh, it's really raining hard. Self-realization is a great science, and it takes many years to implement it completely. But when you do, the results are incomparable. You can't get similar results from any other kind of activity. Especially the holy name is so sweet, huh? it's so relishable, that once you taste it, there's nothing else that can compare. So Srila Rupa Goswami quotes an old uh, description from the story of Maharaj Prithu, where he says, uh, I can't properly relish the sweetness of the holy name with one tongue and one pair of ears. Huh? The holy name is unlimited, but my ability to chant it is very limited. So please, my Lord, give me millions of tongues and millions of ears so that I can relish your holy name properly. Huh? I mean, just like if there's a whole lake, like here there's a very beautiful lake. It's, it's big, several kilometers wide and and long, and uh, you, you can't possibly drink all the water in that lake. Well, you can drink maybe a little bit, and then you become full. So similarly, the holy name is like an ocean, never mind a lake. And what to speak of an ordinary ocean that has a bottom and a shore, huh? it has some limit. The ocean of the holy name is unlimited, it has no bottom, it has no shore. Huh? It's an unlimited ocean. It's like if you've ever been out in the, in the ocean on an island. I lived on a small island, Guam, and I went to many other islands in the Pacific. And when you're on these islands, the ocean just, it just, just goes out unlimitedly. I mean, you can't, you can't imagine, even in an airplane. Huh? You'll be in an airplane at 30,000 feet. And you can't see anything but water. It's so huge. In fact, it's pretty obvious when you're out there that the Earth is round. Huh? Because the horizon is the same distance in every direction. And you know you came from someplace over the horizon. Huh? So. I mean, it's really not a big deal to think that the Earth is round. How could they ever think that it was flat? Really, that's my question. 
Huh? They must have been really stupid people. But uh, we relish this ocean of the holy name to the degree that we are able. Uh, just like if you're swimming in the ocean. Some people can't swim at all. And they're like people who can't relish this sweetness of the holy name. Some people can swim a little bit. Uh, they're like the neophytes. Huh? And some people can swim and dive and do all kinds of different strokes and backwards and everything. Huh? They're like the expert devotees, the advanced devotees, who are uh, expert in relishing the beauty of this transcendental holy name of God. Man, it's really coming down. I don't know if you can hear this. 